Scott, it is so good to see you. Um, you're one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, every time I talk to you, I walk away enriched and inspired. Um, and you, you are not like, you are not like the standard person in your industry, uh, uh, which is a good thing. And the industry you're in is, <laughs> is charity. <laughs> Non nonprofit. Even the industry starts out with a negative. <laughs> I know they, they define themselves by what they're not. I know. Uh, you know, you wear black. You're you're button. You're you're buttoned up all the way to the top because you're cool. You know, I'm just cold and uh, it's cold. It's just cold. Your wife is a is a globally recognized famous designer. I mean, you sh you should be in tech or some you know some cr cool creative industry, but you went into charity. How? <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I mean, I know your story. It didn't start out that way. <laughs> it didn't start out that way. I, I look. I think my life is kind of three acts. Um, I was born in a very middle class family uh, in Philadelphia. My dad was a business guy. My mom was a writer for the newspaper. And when I was four, there was this really kind of formative tragedy that happened that I, I wouldn't have even necessarily thought was a tragedy growing up uh, until you get the space to look back. But what happened was there was a carbon monoxide gas leak in our home. And on New Year's Day, 1980, my mother collapses unconscious on the, the bedroom floor. So she was the canary in the coal mine, which led to visits from the gas company, detectors, um, finally the discovery of huge amounts of carbon monoxide in her bloodstream. And then the actual leak, which was this furnace in the basement that was just improperly installed. And, you know, had this continued, we all could have died. Uh, my dad and I had a bunch of symptoms. We wound up bouncing back and my mom never did. Mm -hmm. So she became permanently disabled. She was an invalid for the rest of my life. And what happened to her was her immune system just irreparably shut down. Mm -hmm. And it just was unable to process the world. Uh, anything chemical, you know, if, if it was a car fume, it would knock her out. If it was, you know, perfume or soap or, you know, the ink from books would make her sick. And what this resulted in was just her living in isolation, basically. So she would live in these special rooms covered in tin foil, and she would sleep on army cots that were washed in baking soda 20 times, uh, and, and she wore masks. So I, I didn't even realize this, I think, until COVID, but the trauma you know, that we all experienced, I just never saw my mom's face. It was always covered with a 3M mask. Um, you know, some version of the N95 and she would cycle and, and try them all. So I grew up as an only child in a very religious, uh, conservative Christian home. And I really watched my dad stick by my mom and I watched his faith and it was a, you know, a faith with integrity really do that for him. You know, he didn't run off. He, they didn't sleep in the same room for 10 years. And he was really helping to take care of a, a very disabled person. And he was, you know, he was an executive and um, could have, could have done a lot of things with that. And he didn't. So I, I grew up in this, in the church. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor. And if you'd asked me in childhood, you know, Scott, what are you going to be when you grow up? I was going to cure my mom and I was going to cure all the other sick people that I'd met with a, a similar condition. And I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, uh, I didn't do drugs, I didn't curse, and I didn't sleep around. So that was act one. <laughs> I think people know where this is going. <laughs> you know where this I mean, is going. I mean, this setup is amazing for this beautiful child. <laughs> and act two was this radical rebellion moment where I woke up one day and said, no, nah, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be a good church kid. I want to have sex. I want to try drugs. I want to drink. I want to smoke. I want to travel the world. I want to drive a fast car. I want a Rolex watch. Uh, I want to date supermodels. And uh, I, I actually found there was a job where you could have a shot at many of these things. And it was called a nightclub promoter. And if you could get the right people inside the right New York City clubs, and if you could kind of orchestrate this magic past the velvet rope, past the one-way glass, uh, you could charge people astronomical amounts to buy drinks. Uh, you could sell a $1,000 bottle of champagne 
that only cost you 40. You could sell a $25 vodka Red Bull that cost you 25 cents to make. So to the horror of my parents, to the horror of their church friends, uh, I moved to New York City at 18 and I join a band. I grow my hair down on my shoulder. You know, the band breaks up because we were a disaster and hated That's each other. And do, I yeah. become this club promoter and I work at 40 clubs over the next 10 years. And I'm climbing up New York City's social ladder. I probably got to top eight. You know, there were eight of us running nightlife in, in New York City. And it was a life of, as we would say, models and bottles. You know, if you got the models in the club, uh, the, the banker guys would come in and they'd throw down their Amex black and they would buy bottles of champagne or bottles of vodka to, to be around the models. And, you know, I'm, I'm, Hopefully, uh, there, there's some tongue, tongue in cheek here that's that's coming off. But you know, over the over the ten years, it was a selfish life. Um, I did start smoking two packs a day. I did start drinking heavily. I did, you know, start with marijuana and then cocaine and MDMA and ecstasy. And I had a gambling problem. I had a pornography problem. Kind of all of the vices <laughs> that you might imagine would come with uh, a job where you go to the club at midnight. And then you go to the after hours at 5 a.m. And then you go home at noon and pop a couple Ambien, you know, to try to put yourself to sleep while other people are on their lunch break eating salads. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and you, you realize you got to wake up to a life of doing everything. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you looked at me at 28, I had some of these markers of success that I'd collected. I had the BMW. I had the Rolex watch. My girlfriend was on the cover of fashion magazines. I had a nice loft in New York City with the grand piano. And I was just the worst person you would have met. I was, uh, I was a hedonist. I was a decadent, um, selfish, sycophant. I was emotionally bankrupt. I was morally bankrupt. I was spiritually bankrupt. I mean, my life was unrecognizable from this young kid who wanted to be a doctor and serve his mom and serve others. And what happened, really, I don't get to tell this story all the time, but uh, one day half my body just inexplicably went numb. And I remember I, I, don't I couldn't... I don't, I don't think of it as inexplicable. Well, that's what my friend said. You know, for me, it was inexplicable, Simon. I was going to live forever. I mean, you know, I was on top of the world. I'm in the, I'm in the DJ booth spraying champagne down over the crowd, okay, while some right. Paris DJ flew in. So for me, it was inexplicable. And yeah, you're right. My club partner was like, bro, you know, no wonder your body's breaking down. I mean, I saw what you did last night. So... I think what was so powerful for me was I was forced, I was faced with mortality almost instantly. Yeah. You know, what if I have a brain tumor? Why can't I feel my arms and my legs? I remember putting my right arm under boiling hot water. I could see the steam coming up and I couldn't feel it. Oof. And I just thought, well, I'm going to die. And if I die, like, what are they going to, what are they going to say about me? What are they going to put on my tombstone? And the only thing I could come up with is, you know, here lies a club promoter who got a million people wasted. And, and that was my legacy was getting people drunk and okay. Maybe he dated some pretty girls and he drove a car and he had a watch. And I think I just realized, oh my gosh, I, I am in the proverbial pig stead. <laughs> I, I, I am kind of covered in feces yeah. and I, I, I got to make a change. I, I got to do something. I, I got to try to find my way back. I got to find my way back home. Yeah. And I remember going into the doctors and I got the MRIs and the brain scans and the CT scans and the EKGs and nobody could find anything physically wrong with me. There was no brain tumor. Um, but, you know, for me, I think I, I maybe I over spiritualized it, but I thought it was a wake up call to assess yeah. my life and and you know, what would be next? And I remember I started praying again. I remember starting to go back to church in New York City and the, the churches were meeting in these fluorescent lit cafeterias and the music was awful. And, you know, I, I went to a, a church, like a famous church and everybody's wearing khakis and I was in all black and, you know, it just, it, it was a little dissonant. But I remember, you know, reading the Bible again and I came to this verse in James uh, where it said, true religion is to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And I was like, I'm over two. 
I mean, I have done nothing for anyone in 10 years. And not only am I polluted, I'm actually polluting others for a living. Yeah. And this led to, I guess, act three and, and being a pretty radical guy. Um, I got this idea that I would uh, tithe, which was this concept I'd grown up with in the church was to give 10%. And typically you tithe your money. I said, I'm going to tithe my time. I'm going to give one year of the 10 years that I have wasted. And I'm going to go see if I can be useful. Can I be useful to others? Mm -hmm. And my idea was simply to volunteer on some sort of humanitarian mission and, 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 and see where that took me and see if any of my skills could be useful. And the, I think you remember this, but you know, I was all excited. I sell everything I own. I'm going to start life over at 28 and I apply to the red cross and I apply to save the children and Oxfam and doctors without borders and you know, 10 organizations that I tangentially heard of. And I'm denied by all 10 organizations. You know, it turns out Doctors Without Borders is looking for actual doctors, not nightclub promoters for their mission. So I remember just being so uh, deflated. You know, the hard part was me changing the intention of my life. Here I want to go yeah, and yeah. nobody will take me. And, uh, you know, I think it was the 11th or the 12th organization uh, wound up writing me back and said, hey, Scott, if you're willing to pay us $500 a month, <laughs> and if you're willing to go live in the poorest country in the world at the time, which was Liberia, West Africa, and Simon, I could not have found Liberia on a map. I, I had never heard of Liberia before. And they said, well, we're going on a, on a medical mission to Liberia. We're looking for a photojournalist. Um, I had actually kind of part-time limped through New York University and gotten a degree in communications that I'd never used. So I dust that off and I say, I, I can take pictures and I can write. Uh, and they said, we'll take you on this mission for one year. And I mean, in some ways, it was the perfect opposite of my life. Go to the mm -hmm. poorest country in the world, pay every single month for the pleasure of volunteering and, and then see if I could be useful. Mm -hmm. And that really started act three at, at um, 28 years old. And I was going to be living on a 522 foot hospital ship. You and I actually met on a boat. So uh, we met on actually a, not a very nice cruise liner, a, a very dated and tired uh, ocean liner. Was, this was, was even older. older. This was a 50-year-old ship that yeah. used to sail and it had been gutted and turned into a state-of-the-art hospital. Um, but it was a really old ship. And it was a simple yeah. idea. This charity brought the best doctors and surgeons on their vacation time and sailed a hospital ship up and down the coast of Africa and just yeah. offered free medical care. And I had this moment of, of real clarity before I joined the ship. Uh, and I would have to surrender my passport. And I got fantastically drunk the night before. Uh, I smoked three packs of cigarettes. Uh, and I just remember saying, I want to quit it all. I mean, I, I, I never want to smoke again. I, I never want to touch drugs again. I never want to gamble again. I never want to look at a pornographic image again. Like, I want a new life. Yeah. And the beauty was I was going to be in a completely new environment. So I would yeah. have this clean start. It wasn't cool to smoke with doctors, right? right. It wasn't right. cool to like go in the bathroom and do a line of cocaine on a hospital ship. Yeah. Yeah. So I went like all in. I went out with a bang and then I walked up the gangway the next, next morning and I surrendered my passport and they started billing me $500 a month. And that, that started a, a whole new journey. What? Did you make these decisions alone? Because this is what I find fascinating about your story. You know, most people who go through what you go through, they are come to Jesus moments where they have a an existential event that scares them straight, which is what happened with you. Yeah. But sometimes there's an intervention and sometimes, you know, you consult with people or you do it with someone. What I find so astonishing about your story is it's very much of it's a very solo journey. Maybe that's because you grew up an only child and that's sort of that, that you and, and a mother who couldn't be there in the same way for you that other mothers were and a busy dad. And so maybe you were just raised to be that independent that you just sort of that's how it operated, which, by the way, is what got you into trouble. But it's also the thing that seemed to have saved you. Was there anyone in your life supporting you, encouraging you? G you know, d did your friends say, Scott, you're making a ton of money and you're living this life, but we're worried about you? Like, was there ever a, an attempt from the outside to help you before the scare? There was not an intervention. We were all in it together and we were right. all drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, and we would see people die. 
we would see a, a nightclub bouncer overdose. We'd see somebody, you know, over here at this club think that they were snorting cocaine and they snorted heroin and they're dead. Um, we were just kind of living like recklessly and, and, and having too much fun. Now, my parents, I will say, for those people <laughs> listening who believe in the power of prayer, I mean, they had a decade of <laughs> church prayer chains, little old ladies locked up in prayer closets, wearing the holes in carpets with their knees. I mean, there were probably 50 people praying the prodigal home over a yeah. decade and getting yeah. absolutely no results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, was, it's really, I was it's really it makes, uninterested. It, it makes a case for persistence for sure. The but so and, and then my when parents, you, of course, were supportive when I came back. Of course, well, I would say my club friends. I remember sending an email saying, "Hey, I'm going to Liberia, West Africa. I'm joining a medical mission as a photojournalist, and you know, stay tuned." And I remember there was just a, they were just curious. I just I just like this guy invited me to a Prada megastore opening last weekend. What do you mean he's going to Liberia? So there was a real interest and a curiosity in, in the beginning. And Did then as I actually embraced that and I started to tell stories, Simon, people were really interested. They were moved. There was almost this sense of, you know, wistfulness that people would reply to my emails and, and, and feel like, I remember once, you know, I was telling a story about somebody we'd helped on the hospital ship and the woman wrote me back and she said, I'm, I'm sitting here at my desk at Chanel headquarters. And I'm in a brightly lit, beautiful office, and I have tears streaming down my face. I want to be where you are. Yeah. You know, I want my work to matter. I, and I know, I know you talk so much about purpose. And yeah. so I kind of instantly found my purpose for the first time at 28 years old. And I was able to uh, allow people to vicariously kind of live through that discovery moment because I was writing so much and I was sharing these stories and, and how I was experiencing it. How would you have defined that purpose then? You said, I found my purpose. What what was that? Well, it, it took a minute. You know, it's funny. I'm a, I'm a big Heroes Journey fan. And, you know, I didn't, I, it wasn't until I actually wrote a book that I, you get to reflect on these things yeah. and, and realize, you know, I met a guide um, in the first couple weeks of Mercy Ships. I met this man who was the chief medical officer and his name was Dr. Gary Parker. And he was a legend. So I'd, I'd heard about Dr. Gary, you know, oh, you're going to get to meet Dr. Gary. Mm -hmm. Well, his story was he was a California plastic surgeon. He also, like me, had heard of this opportunity to volunteer. Mm -hmm. He actually was a doctor <laughs> and he signed up for three months. And when I joined on my first day of volunteering, mm -hmm. it was his 21st year. Wow. So his three months turned into two decades of medical service aboard that ship. He never went back to his plastic surgery practice. And I remember meeting him and just wanting to know everything I could about what made him go, uh, what drove him. Mm -hmm. And he was a deeply humble, compassionate, um, but unbelievably proficient, skilled surgeon. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember just that glimpse of, okay, well, I'm starting year one. What would it look like if I'm doing this in year 21? Mm -hmm. And and I got to spend a lot of time with him in the operating theater, you know, these eight and nine hour surgeries where I would scrub up and I would I would watch him and talk to him. And so I think that it was it was finding the purpose through service. Um and you know, I mean, I'll I'll just tell the story. I mean, my third day there, Simon, so we we would the way that this worked is that the ship was going to be coming in 350 yeah. volunteer crew, 40 bed hospital, three operating theaters, and a small team, an advanced team had flyered the whole country looking for sick people. Mm -hmm. And we would say on this day, mm -hmm. uh, sick people turn up and the doctors will triage you. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we came into the port, I learned that the government had given us the soccer stadium. The, the kind of decrepit uh, football stadium in the center of the city to mm -hmm. triage the patients. And I knew that we had 1,500 available surgery slots to fill um, mm -hmm. over the next eight months. Right. And, you know, I remember getting up at five in the morning. It was still dark. I put on the hospital scrubs. I grabbed my two uh, Nikon D1X digital cameras. This was the, the brand new era of digital cameras. And I jumped in this convoy of Land Rovers with the doctors and the nurses, and we snaked through the city. 
And as we get to the stadium, uh, there are 5,000 sick people standing in the parking lot waiting for us to open the door and offer 1,500 people access to surgery. And that was such a, a, a powerful, cathartic moment for me. I remember just weeping, you know, realizing 3,500 sick people were going to be sent home without care. Yeah. Uh, I later learned many of these people had walked for more than a month. They'd walked from other countries, from Sierra Leone, from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, from Guinea, just in the hope of seeing a doctor, some with their kids wow. in tow. And we didn't have enough doctors. We didn't have enough resources. And that was so animating for me, I think, um, and, and just so opposite of, of my life of the previous 10 years. Yeah. Can you share one story from, from the ship over that year that really captures the, the impact, you know, like one of the stories you sent to your friend at Chanel? <laughs> well, the first boy uh, that I actually photographed was a 14-year-old boy named Alfred. And if I'm describing him as I saw him, he is this uh, very thin uh, West African child, and he has a volleyball-sized pink tumor occupying his mouth. Uh, had a hard time breathing, had a hard time eating. And his mom actually came in tow with a picture of her son four years previous at 10 years old, and he was he, he looked like, like my 10-year-old. Uh, he, he looked completely normal. And as she started to tell his story through a translator, she said, you know, this, this small lump started growing and then it got bigger and there was no surgeon to take her son to. So she took him to the local witch doctor mm-hmm. and there was a series of spells that were cast and chicken blood was put on the tumor and it just continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And four years later, you know, at the front of the line, she was smart to bring him there a couple days early. So that he'd be seen, I'm I'm face to face with this 14 year old child who is suffocating to death on his own face in front of me, mm-hmm. and I'd never seen anything like this before. And he was terrified, and I was terrified. Mm-hmm. And I remember going in the corner and just uh, kind of breaking down. Like I don't know that I can do this. I, I I've never seen suffering like this before. And you know, knowing there were 1,499 people behind him. And my job was going to be to photograph everybody up close and personal for the medical library with mm. their deformity, with their conditions. And one of the doctors came over and kind of kicked me in the butt. And he's like, kid, I thought you were from New York City. You know, you sh- they don't make them tougher than that in New York. You know, get back there. Go do your job. Um, and, and hey, by the way, we're, gonna, we're here to help this kid. You know, this kid's going to, he's going to be fine. And I managed to get through those, those two days of screening, taking 1,500 people, seeing far worse than Alfred, people with missing faces, people who had been burned beyond recognition by rebel soldiers who poured oil on their faces, hoping to disfigure them. And, and then a couple of days later, I did get to see Alfred's surgery. And I watched Dr. Gary meticulously uh, remove the tumor, reconstruct his jaw, reconstruct his face. And I got to watch him heal on the ward. And then I remember asking, I said, hey, can I personally drive Alfred home to his village? It was a couple hours away. And I I wanted to see the whole thing from beginning to middle to end. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, you know, jumping out of the Land Rover and I was rolling video and, and Alfred is just surrounded in his village by hundreds of people who had written this little boy off for dead. Uh, They thought he was cursed. He had done something, obviously, to offend the gods, right? But that's why something was growing on his face. And just here he is, restored to health and restored to life. And it was just such a powerful... and, and, And that happened because these doctors had said yes, because they had come. Instead of going to the Maldives, which they certainly could have afforded as surgeons, they decided to go to Liberia for a month. And, and some of them, you know, to, to leave their families at home so they could help other families who didn't have access. Um, so I saw a version of that story on repeat, you know, time and time again. I remember just one, one other short one. We did cataract surgeries. I remember meeting this woman. She was 25 years old and she couldn't see, but she was born with sight. And these severe cataracts had developed over the last eight years or so. So she goes blind at 17. And she'd since gotten married and actually had a daughter and she'd never seen her daughter. And I remember being in the operating theater, Simon, thinking, oh my gosh, I could do this cataract surgery. It was like 10 minutes. 
you know, a guy took a scalpel and he like cut the side of the eye and he stuck in some tweezers and he pulled out the cataract and he put a new lens in and like, that was it. I think it was like 10 or 15 minutes. And again, I wanted to be there to capture the moment when she could see again. So a couple days later, uh, I have my camera and they remove the patch and she could see, and she started screaming. She yeah. tackled me. She tackled the nurse. You know, she's dancing and screaming. Uh, she could see her daughter. She could see her sister. And I just remember thinking, I mean, I think this cost $280. This is less than a bottle of vodka in a club. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it really makes us question our values, doesn't it? How can it not? You, you finished the you finished the year, Scott. What happens? I just wanted more. I just wanted more. Um, I wanted. I didn't want that to end. I didn't yeah. want being around these people, uh, self sacrificing people, stories, miracles, medical miracles. Um, I didn't want it to end. So I came back to New York. That the ship took a couple months off, where they would dry dock it and they would kind of you know outfit it for the next mission. And that second year for me was really more of the same. Um, spending more time with Dr. Gary, taking uh, more patients home, watching their lives being transformed. I gotten exposed to so much, but I remember seeing in the second year, a child drink dirty water in a village. And this was a, a you know, 10 year old, 13 year old, 13 year old girl. Her name was Hawa. And she walked into this green murky swamp that you could see the bugs. You could actually see insects in the swamp. And she just takes a drink from the swamp. And, you know, I'm talking to her and, and I realize this is the only water, this disgusting water that I wouldn't let my dog drink. Mm -hmm. The only water that she had ever experienced in her entire life. Mm -hmm. She drank this water. She bathed with this water. She washed her clothes with this water. She cooked with this water. And you know, I remember just kind of being so shocked, like, oh my gosh, like she's drinking dirty water. And then I, I started to pull on that string and I went into more villages and I saw that so many of these villages didn't have clean water. They were drinking from a version of that dirty swamp. And I learned two very simple things, which kind of propelled me into, you know, the, the start of charity water. I learned that half of the country was drinking dirty water. Jeez. So half of the country yeah. was drinking contaminated water every day. And then I learned, according to the World Health Organization, half of the disease in the country was because people were drinking dirty water yeah, and didn't have access to sanitation and hygiene. And yeah. I remember showing Dr. Gary my pictures from these remote villages as yeah. he was in scrubs and in the operating theater. And, you know, <laughs> he kind of said, yeah, we know, <laughs> we know. Why don't you go do something about it? Why don't you go? You, you, you give people clean water and you eliminate half the diseases. Exactly. And, and I think I just, I, I did the math and I said, well, if these people had water, there wouldn't be 5,000 people standing in a parking lot. There'd right. be 2,500 people, maybe even less. Right. And it was sort of that eureka moment, that discovery of, well, the root cause of so much of this sickness is something so basic. And then yet at the time, Simon, one billion people in the world, one out of six people alive didn't have access to it. And so Gary, kind of my, you know, my guide after two years just says, kid, you're 30 years old. You know, sure, you could help us continue to fund expensive surgeries on the ship, or you could just go and get the whole world clean water. I was like, okay, I, I will just go get the whole world clean water. Mm -hmm. And that ended the time with Mercy Ships. And I came back to New York and I was completely broke. Uh, I was exactly 30. I had given all my money to Mercy Ships and the people that I'd met in, in Africa and nightclub promoters are not good savers anyway, or investors, right? Whatever we made, we spent a little more. We can call it investment, but sure, I'll go with it. <laughs> so, you know, I really was starting from zero and my, yeah. my old uh, promoting friend took me in and let me live on his closet floor in Soho uh, on Spring and Mercer in Manhattan. And he said, ah, you know, you can, you can sleep on my closet floor for free rent. And that was really the start of Charity Water was this call from Dr. Gary. It was uh, trying to do something about the two years and everything that I'd seen, and then trying to start an organization to actually bring clean water to a billion people. So l let's just flash forward to current day, right? Um, how old is Charity Water now? We're 17 years old. 
So you've been doing this for the past 17 years. How many uh, wells have you built around the world? Over 150,000. 150,000 wells. You have top marks in Charity Navigator, yeah. meaning, and for very specific reason, because you developed a model, because you because you know the cynicism of of where money goes in charities, and so much of it goes to overhead, yep. and so little of it goes to the cause. And some of the famous charities that we all, quote unquote, give to, because we just assume it's a famous charity, that it's a well-run charity, yep. actually an, ad an abysmally small amount of money that we give to these famous charities goes to the actual cause. It goes to overhead and salaries and bonuses and all of the rest of it. What percentage a charity order of outside donated money goes directly to building wells? Yeah. So from day one, 100%. 100%. So, I mean, this, I think, you know, in the founding moment, I had the advantage of not knowing any better, Simon. I mean, I picked up HTML. I, I picked up um, I picked up HTML for dummies because I was going to have to build a website and I picked up how to start a charity for dummies, you know, 501c3s for dummies. Yeah. And and what I did have the advantage, I think, is as so many entrepreneurs or people who are just trying to solve problems in the world, yeah. is I was just talking to my friends and everyday people and I realized everything you just said. There was a cynicism. There was a skepticism about charity. And I, I thought, well, you know, I would ask people, what would the perfect charity look like? What would because everybody loved the issue, right? When I'm sure. when I said, Hey, I'm on a mission to bring clean water to everybody in the world, I mean, no one was saying wrong goal right. or dumb idea. You know, nobody was saying let them drink bad water and die. Right. Right. Um, but it, it was the 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 construct people had a problem with. So I remember just saying, like, what would what would the perfect charity look like? And a lot of people just said, Well, I'd know that all my money actually went to help people. Yeah. Well, now that's actually impractical because the charity does have costs and you have to pay your team members and you have to take flights to develop programs and need an office if you're working out of an office and, and insurance and toner for the Epson copy machine, right? <laughs> but I remember just thinking, well, what if I opened up a separate bank account and I got a very different group of people to pay the unsexiest overhead costs? What if I went to entrepreneurs, to people who had built businesses, people who had hired and recruited and retained talent, and that would never be the public's problem. And so that's what it looked like, you know, not knowing any better. I, I you know, got my little 501c3 and I walked down to Chase Bank, uh, a commerce bank at the time before they got bought by Chase. And I opened up two separate bank accounts, the public bank account, which we called the water account, and then the overhead account. I think there was a couple hundred dollars in each. And said, never the two should meet. You know, this is yeah. going to be church and state. And I, I remember having this idea that felt like a good idea then. And I've, I've regretted many times since. But I said, well, even get a payback credit card fees so that there's total integrity in the 100%. You know, right. so if Simon goes on right now and he pulls out his Amex and he gives 100 bucks, sadly, we get 97 I said, we're going to go and raise that, that Amex transaction fee, that three bucks, and we'll put right. it back together with the 97 and we're going to send Simon's whole intended hundred dollars of the field. <laughs> that was great when you're not at scale. Um, so that was kind of the first big pillar. And then the second thing just built on that. Well, well, if money's not fungible, couldn't we build technology to actually track these donations and show people where they ended up? Couldn't yeah. we show Simon that his hundred dollars ended up in this village in yeah. Southern Malawi? And couldn't we show them the satellite image on yeah. Google Earth and Google Maps after that project was built? So we started to kind of build this second pillar, which turned out to be very unique to Charity Water, which was proof, closing yeah. the loop, showing people yeah. where their money went, where 100% of their money went. So, so I, 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 need to, I need to double click on this. I need to underscore what you're doing here. Two bank accounts, a small group of wealthy individuals who commit to pay for your overhead so that every public donation, whether somebody goes to your website or donates their birthday or 100% of public donation goes directly to the cause and you will follow that money and you will show somebody, you will give somebody the, the GPS coordinates, they can go on Google Earth and they can literally see a photograph of, their ex of the exact well that their money bought. That's, I mean, that's what we built. And that to me, it, it's so genius in, in its simplicity that it, it, it answers every cynicism question that people ask about charities. And it simply does the thing that nobody else has ever done, which is where does my money go? How do I know? 
is you it's 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 just elegant yeah. and, and now I, I will say you know it, sometimes charities spend too little on their operating costs and they actually don't run great programs we just said there's a group of people who we think we can inspire and and get excited about paying those operating costs so therefore the really the disenfranchised skeptical cynical public at large yeah. can give in the purest way yeah. and you know i mean we're we take this really far simon we've forced our auditors kpmg to write an opinion about the 100 percent model every single year so that's posted on our website you cannot go on charity water on any page on our website of which there's thousands and find any way to donate to overhead you, you literally have to document it with a paper trail if we put it into that overhead account so, you know, we've really tried to, because a lot of people say, oh, do they really do it? No, we actually do it. So when you, when you started, when you started uh, Charity Water 17 years ago, there were a billion people who, who needed clean water. How many yep. today? We're down to 700 million on a, a 7 billion plus population. So we've gone from one in six in the world to one in 10 in the world. So we've made a lot of progress. You know, I, I was having a conversation yesterday with, with someone as, you know, how do you keep people... Uh, energized, you know, over such a long period of time. And I think it's our job to show that this is a solvable problem. Yeah, it's a solvable problem. Um, the, the tension though, Simon, is like, oh my gosh, how come we haven't done it? I, I mean, you know, Elon, God bless him, he's looking for water 142 million miles away on another planet, right? And as we go up into space and we look down at our blue planet, 700 million people are not drinking blue water. They're, they're drinking dirty water every day. And, you know, 700 million people is twice the population of the United States. So it's a huge, huge group of people. Yeah. Uh, and we have not created the will to solve this problem yet. We have not come together and mobilized the resources. But what's great about water is it is completely solvable. Yeah. Uh, my mother eventually passed away from pancreatic cancer late stage pancreatic cancer, the doctors had absolutely no idea how to help her. I mean, it went immediately to palliative. We have friends that are suffering from Parkinson's, from ALS, right? Billions of dollars are being spent to hopefully unlock the cure for these diseases, which is unknown whether yeah. we actually get there. Water's yeah. not like that. Like we have the cure. It's called clean water. In the West, you know, we have so much clean water that we fill our toilets with potable water it's true like we don't mind if the drug drinks from the toilet it's a it's a you know i mean you could drink from the toilet it's, it's a gross thought but the water is clean in our toilets because That's it's true. too expensive to put two sets of pipes in so we're just like eh, just fl literally flush drinkable water and so it's so abundant to the point of waste that it doesn't affect us and i think the story for me is not can you sympathize with somebody with no water it's it's it, it, some people can, but that's not enough people, yeah. right? Because more people's families are affected by cancer than dirty water in the West, sure. which, is the, which is the source of your income. For me, this is a bigger story. This is a call to service, and the that you went, you know, you had to go to an extreme near death, you know, uh, um, hedonistic life to have a come to Jesus moment, literally and figuratively. Uh, to turn your life around. And you said it yourself, what you discovered was the intense, intense joy of service that you, no drug, no alcohol, yeah. no model, no watch, no car, none of that was ever able to replicate that feeling. And Dr. Gary, who was a well-meaning guy, who was like, eh, I make good money. I'm a good surgeon. I'll do three months. That Check that box. I'll, maybe he I'll got, do it. He got every bitten year. by the bug too. He got bitten by the bug. Twenty-one years later, the guy's walked away from a very successful plastic surgery practice because nothing can recreate the intense feeling of service to another. And you know, I've had my experiences, and the path that I'm on is because I too realized that that the the intensity and the the feeling of service that no thrill that I can buy or achieve can ever come close. And that's the thing. I think we've confused the thrill of life, the thrills. We've confused the thrills of life with the joy of life, right? Mm -hmm. The watch is a thrill. The car is a thrill. The, the, all of these things are, you know, winning, getting a promotion, getting a raise. They're all thrills. And those thrills die 
pretty quickly, which is why we keep trying to find another thrill. And we think we're living happy lives by simply repeating thrill after thrill and needing to find bigger and bigger thrills. And it's incredibly unfulfilling. Joy, joy is sustainable. It comes with difficult days. It comes with fun days. It comes with days that are thrilling and days that are just boring. But it's just sustainable. And the analogy is, we don't like our children every day, but we love our children every day. Hmm. And many of us are trying to find ways to like life, but we don't love life. I, I think you might have said to me many years ago, uh, and, and I've used this line on stage you know, multiple times, the, the more you give, the more you give. You know, it, this is something, it's, it's almost like a muscle. You know, when you work it, 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 you want to give more. The more you serve, the more you serve. But you, you invented something, which I think has been repeated by other charities, and I, and I think it should be because it's a brilliant idea, which is you figured out how to give people that sense of joy and service, not just from opening their wallets, but by, by, by doing service. And this is about, you invented the concept of donating your birthday. Donating your birthday is super simple, which is you, you ask people to figure out their own way. So there's the act of service, which is they have to spend yep. energy. Like, yep. y y and social capital. They have to ask their friends for money. They have to ask their friends. Like they, it's, 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 it's turnkey-ish, but it, you, you don't make it easy. They have to do some work. And they have to call their friends and say, instead of giving me a present, if I'm turning 12 years old, I want you to donate $12 to Charity Water. I'm raising money and I'm donating yep. my birthday. And yep. you've had children raise thousands of dollars. My gosh. Um, my gosh. So, you know, this this is what happened. I think the big idea too was your age in dollars. That was the sticky marketing message. So someone would turn 17 and then they would ask for $17. Right, someone exactly. would turn 52 and then they would ask for $52 from everybody right. they know. Right. And yeah, I mean, you, you know, the story you were really around at the time. There were so many children were doing this all over the country. And there was this one little girl in Seattle. Um, and, and gosh, I, I haven't told this story in a while and it still makes me, uh, it still makes me emotional. She, she, her name was Rachel Beckwith and she was eight and she'd heard me speak and talk about this birthday idea. So she cancels her ninth birthday. She does not accept any gifts. And she sets out to raise $300, which at the time would help 10 people get clean water. And, you know, this is a compassionate kid. She'd heard the kids were dying of cancer. She cut her hair, you know, the year before and donated it to Locks of Love. So this, this was a girl who got it. And she only raises $220. And, you know, she feels like she has let children down in Africa because she did not hit her goal. And a couple of weeks later, uh, unfortunately, there's this terrible 15 car pileup on the interstate and she's killed in a car crash. And she's the only fatality. Her mom was driving. Her sister was in the front. She was in the back seat and a tractor trailer um, smashed into the car. And I remember I was in Central African Republic at the time. I landed at JFK. I turned my Blackberry on and her, her pastor had emailed and said, hey, it was a little girl in my church. She donated her birthday to Charity Water. Her campaign closed. She fell a little short. Would you please open that campaign again? She's just she's just tragically passed, and we'd like to honor her memory. And I remember, you know, Vic and I were were coming from the airport. We walked up our I think it was a seventy store walk up in Tribeca, and I sat down on the couch. We reopened the campaign, and I just remember giving eighty dollars with tears streaming down my eyes, you know, to this little nine year old girl's campaign who is no longer alive. And then this pastor started putting it out and he asked everybody in his church to donate $9. And it started to spread through the Seattle community. Uh, the New York Times got a hold of it. Nick Kristoff did a column. The morning shows starts to spread into Europe. The story of a nine-year-old girl who canceled her birthday and wanted kids to have clean water. Simon, the, the most remarkable thing was I remember people in Africa start giving People in Africa start going on our website and giving $9. She winds up uh, posthumously raising $1.3 million. Mm. And I remember meeting her mom for the first time uh, a few weeks after this. And I just kind of blurted out to her mom. I said, you need to spend the one-year anniversary of Rachel's death with me. Uh, we're going to go to Ethiopia and you're going to meet thousands of children who now have life, who now have water because of your special daughter. 
And uh, a year later, uh, she came with me uh, with her with Rachel's grandparents, and we went village to village. And it was it was an unbelievable thing, kind of seeing the impact of that that first of all the compassion, yeah. And then the service. She actually had to do something. She had to make a sacrifice. You know, girls nine years old are supposed to want stuff for their birthday. And she wanted something for others. And I remember being in one of the villages, Simon, and these elder women, these Ethiopian women came and they they fell prostrate at Rachel's mom's uh, feet and they were just weeping. And, you know, they say through a translator, we also know pain. We have lost children. But your daughter's death gave our children life. And it was just so, so meaningful. And, and then what was even cooler is a couple years later, I, I asked the engineering team to pull the data set. So many people who gave $9 to her campaign, then followed her lead, donated their birthday. They raised another two, two and a half million dollars or so. So this little girl went from a goal of $300 that she didn't achieve while alive and then raised over $3 million, yeah. inspiring complete strangers across the globe to, to give. So that was the power of that idea. You know, people donating their birthdays, people, you know, running campaigns, you know, they've contributed over a hundred million dollars now for clean water, kind of as, as people say, I can do this, I can do this one thing yeah. and make a difference for somebody, for one family, for, yeah. for one village. We, we, you know, I think what inspires me, and I said it before, what inspires me about you and about charity water, which is whether whether water is your thing or not, it's your call to service that I find so powerful. You know, um, and I've known you, I've known you a lot of years. <laughs> I've known you a lot of years when 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 charity water was much smaller, and. Uh, and uh, and you are the most consistent person I know in my life who in the 17 years that you've been doing this and the over a decade that I've known you, uh, you're only you're as passionate today as you were you as you were then. You're unwavering. And if any of us could find, you know, you talk about tithing your time, right, as opposed to tithing your money. If any of us could find 10% of a work day, an hour, you know, a uh, few hours a week, a few hours a month to donate a birthday or go do something for someone else that takes us away from our desks, um, we're literally, we're literally it, it literally makes the world a happier, healthier place. Uh, and I, I mean, yeah, the more you give, the more you give. I mean, it's true. Many, many years ago, someone sent me a picture from a New York City deli and it was from some ancient text. And it was in those, you know, one of those boards where you kind of put up the letters yeah. and it said, do not be afraid of work with no end. Yeah. Do not be afraid of endless work. And, you know, I remember thinking about that for years and, 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 you know, that kind of idea, because, because it's a big problem we're solving. I mean, it seems almost unachievable, you know, 700 million people, we've helped 18 million people. Okay. So my, you know, the 18 million people charity water has helped. You put that into the problem. It's one thirty ninth. It's 2.6% yeah. of the way to goal. But, you know, I've really come to think that that is much more of a way of life. Yeah. You know, if you are asking the question daily, how do I use my time? my talents, my money in the service of others, yeah. there is no finish line. There is no drop the mic moment. Yeah. Uh, it is, it is a, a way of life. It is a yeah. way of service. And I think if you can continue down that path, you kind of turn around at these moments like, oh, well, I kind of achieved more than I thought, or we've helped yeah. more people than I've thought. Yeah. You know, 18 million right now, we, you talked, we, we talked about this. I mean, I remember the first time uh, we met on, on some deck of a, a, a conference ship and I was kind of proud of it. I think we'd raised $10 million or something. And you're like, $10 million? Like, you should have raised like $10 billion. I mean, what are you doing? This is water. You know, this is one of the biggest problems known to humanity. 
you know, why are you thinking so small? And I, I think that honestly, that conversation, Simon, animated me and 18 million feels like I'm in the second inning year yeah. 17. Like I better be in the second inning of this yeah. because there's so much left to be done. You know, one thirty ninth. I'd like to have more than a one thirty ninth or two point six percent impact on the global water crisis. And you know, Daniel Eck, who's who's a, a long term friend, uh, the founder of Spotify. You know, I, I remember just there were a bunch of us at the at the time, and we would set these really big unachievable goals. I remember when he had, I think he had eight hundred thousand paying Spotify members, and he stands in front of the company. He's like, "We're going to a hundred million paid, <laughs> you know, and we're going to do it in ten years." And I think it took him eleven years. Yeah. And I think today he's at three hundred million paid, going to a billion. Yeah. And so that's how I really think about it. But, uh, but, you know, people always talk about charities should put themselves out of business. I find that the most ridiculous idea, you know, oh, put yourself out of business. If charity water actually solves the global water crisis and, and, and we see a day, you know, working in partnership with all the other great orgs out there and the government agencies, and, you know, we're just one piece of this puzzle. But if we see a day on earth when everybody has clean water, we're not going to go drop the mic and try and get rich. We would look out at the other problems and say, is someone hungry? Is someone going to bed with a roof, without a roof over their head, with a leaking house? Is someone, is a mother right now, you know, watching a child die in her arms because she doesn't have access to health care? Let's take our whole community. Let's take all of the generous people we have built trust with over three, four, five decades and say, hey, what else could we do together? What other needless suffering could we stand in the gap for what, how else could we use our time and our talent and our money? So yeah, anyway, that, that there is no, there's no end point. Scott, I could talk to you for hours. Um, unfortunately, um, we would be forcing people to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've had quite enough of us. <laughs> um, you know, I, I said at the beginning, I've never talked to you having not walked away enriched and inspired. And this is no exception. Um, um, I'm grateful you exist. I'm grateful for your hero's journey. Um, and um, thank you for coming on and, and sharing. It's a joy to see you. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for your uh, 15 years of friendship and support and, and uh, advice and sometimes uh, riddling and uh, instigating and encouragement. And it's been, um, it's been really life-giving to me. And you've thank been you. such a, a huge part of, of our journey as well. So thanks, uh, thanks for, for having me on. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.